Hello, everybody. My name is Nancy Proctor. I'm the director of the Peel. We're delighted to have you with us here today for a webinar on online inclusion. This session is being recorded, and the recording, along with a full transcript, will be posted on the Peel's website after the event. Um, the event's going to last about one hour. We'll have the first 40 minutes for the presentations with 20 minutes for questions. You can write your questions in the chat box on the right of the screen at any time. Um, and uh, you should be seeing also captions, live uh, cart transcription of this session by Sally from Caption Access on that same screen. Um, please do be in touch directly with us if you have any accessibility needs or suggestions. Our email address is access at thepeelcenter.org. And you can also reach us on social media. We are at The Peel on Twitter and Facebook and The Peel Baltimore on Instagram. I'd like to begin this event by acknowledging with humility that the lands where The Peel and the whole city of Baltimore are situated today are the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock indigenous peoples. The vast coastal area today known as Baltimore City, Maryland, sustained indigenous peoples until the arrival of Europeans beginning in the 1600s. Over the next 400 years, many Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock communities were decimated, absorbed by larger villages or tribes and or forced by the US federal government to move west beyond the Mississippi River with larger tribes. Since then, other tribal peoples have moved here in diaspora, including Lumbee peoples. On January 9, 2012, two tribes of Piscataway, the Piscataway Kanoi tribe and the Piscataway Indian Nation, became the first tra tribes recognized by the state of Maryland. In 2017, the state also recognized the Akahanic Indian tribe. We acknowledge the Peel stands on stolen lands, and I would also like to acknowledge that this history and thanks was adapted from an original text authored by Ryan Coons, Peter Dayton, and Ashley Minner of the Lumbee tribe. I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, the leaders of our webinar, starting with Robin Marquis, who is a Baltimore-based accessibility and the arts consultant. She is accessibility, accessibility coordinator at the Peel and also community outreach coordinator for Access Smithsonian, among many other hats. Cheryl Fogel Hatch will also be presenting today. She is an archaeologist and former board member of the National Federation of the Blind, Baltimore chapter, specializes uh, in researching and developing multisensory experiences in galleries, museums, and other cultural organizations. And finally, we will also hear from Alice Krieger, uh, known as Gentle Heron in Second Life. Uh, president of Virtual Ability, Inc., the international cross-disability peer support community that enables access for people of all abilities to virtual worlds. And I'd like to go back because I think I made a terrible mistake earlier introducing Robin, uh, who does prefer the pronouns they, they are them. So apologies again, Robin, and with that, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you all for being here. Um, we're so excited to be doing this webinar today. The Peel has shown a commitment to accessibility for people with disabilities for the last few years, and this is really the next stage of that for us. Um, as we move programs online, uh, the Peel has been really working hard to find ways that we can make our webinars, um, our programming online accessible. Um, we know that the disability community is our community. Uh, we believe in inclusive storytelling, and this is really part of that commitment. And we also know that this is a learning curve for us and for all of the folks right now who are trying to learn how to make their programs more accessible. So. This is something we, um, a lot of what we're doing today, we're gonna kind of pull back the curtain and show you what the Peel is doing to be more accessible. Um, and we hope that you all join us in that effort. So with that, I am going to share my screen and let's see, Alice is gonna start us off. So I wanna make sure that we are in full screen and slideshow. Alice, can you see that okay? This is Alice and yes, I can. Wonderful, thank you. So I'll start off by saying that everything that all of our presenters today are talking with you about 
is something that we could do an entire session on for each slide. <laughs> so I want to acknowledge that we're going to be going fairly rapidly. This, this part that I'm talking about is how accessibility is all about communication. So if we could go to the next slide, what this shows is that there are different types of disabilities that affect communication. The first type is hearing and speech disabilities. The second type is vision disabilities. The third type is comprehension disabilities. And the fourth type is mobility disabilities. And we will talk about all of those. So the next slide talks about when you're addressing accessibility, there are many options. And the biggest important thing to remember as a presenter, a storyteller, is that you may be unaware of your audience's accessibility needs. And as an audience member, you may be unaware of the storyteller's accessibility needs. So there are really two ways to think about accessibility as communication. One is to say, well, fix it yourself. If you have an accessibility need, you probably own some assistive technology solutions and you should be using those. That's one solution. Another solution, of course, is to provide options that are going to enhance the accessibility for everyone involved. And as a storyteller, you get to choose how you're going to address this. So the next slide talks about the two options for people with hearing and speech disabilities. The assistive technology that is used for people with hearing and speech disabilities includes voice to text and text to voice technologies. These are translation technologies that are available inside almost everyone's computer nowadays. There's also closed captioning, such as the cart that we're seeing from Sally today. Programmatically, you as the person providing the program can do voice and text simultaneously. This is very helpful if you're capable of doing that. And you also will probably want to provide alternatives to sound notifications. The next slide, please shows the two options for people with vision disabilities. The assistive technology that are used by people who are blind or who are low vision includes screen reader software. It includes screen magnifiers. And there are text only virtual world viewers that are available as well if you're presenting inside a virtual world. The programmatic option that is used for people with vision disabilities includes making sure that all text is ASCII. If you put up an image that is including inclusion of text, the text in that image is not available to the technologies that people use. You should provide descriptions of the visual environment if possible. Of course, if you're providing text for people with low vision, be aware of text size. People with color vision issues need to have particular colors that provide the appropriate contrast. And you can provide alternatives to visual notifications. In terms of comprehension, thank you for the next slide. The text readers are used also by people who have comprehension issues. Some people can understand spoken words more easily than they can understand text. And text is easier not just for deaf people, which is what we normally think of when we're providing text as a comprehension option, but it's also important for people whose first language is not English. Many people who speak another language as their first language, including ASL, find text a lot easier to to do than perhaps lip reading when they're looking at people's faces on, on uh, these different platforms. It's also if people are using a translation tool like Google Translate, text is a lot easier. And it also works best for people who get distracted because most text can be rolled back so you can go back in time and look at things that are going on, whereas you can't really do that with the spoken word. 
So the next slide is about mobility difficulties that people may have. They may need to use alternative typing. I use an alternative keyboard. People find many different ways to do alternative typing. We have in our community people who type with their toes rather than their hands. We have people who type with one hand or one finger. We have people whose alphabet streams across the screen and they hit a switch to select the letters that they're typing from. We have people who type with their eyes. They see the keyboard on their screen and they focus on the different letters that they want. And a laser, which is looking at their eye position, types causes that letter to be typed. It's amazing the kinds of assistive technology that are available for people with mobility issues. And also, if you're presenting at a venue, people may be using alternative transportation to get to the venue, and they may be using alternative transportation, such as walkers or wheelchairs when they're in the venue. And sometimes people don't have this transportation. So in terms of programmatic options for people with mobility issues, what we want to have happen is to ensure physical accessibility of the event. And in fact, sometimes virtual events, such as the one you're pretending now, are easier to attend for people with mobility issues. So the next slide shows that when you're addressing accessibility, you may never know of all the accessibility needs. So you can expect people to use what they have. We are, all of us in the disability community are used to using our own tools, but it also pays to provide some of these programmatic options to enhance people's experiences with the content. So we really need to do both. And my last slide is my access. You can email me at a Krieger, K-R-U-E-G-E-R at virtualability.org if you have further questions. Over to you, Robin. This is Robin, thank you. Um, and just another note, this PowerPoint will be available on our website. We will also be um, making available a text document of the same information. PowerPoint is not always accessible for people. So the links, the tips, everything like that um, will be accessible for you to use in the future. So if you're taking notes furiously, um, don't worry, you can use this. So um, my slide says the Peel Center Online Inclusion and there is an image uh, at the front entrance to the Peel Center. It's a red brick building with four white paned windows on either side of a large entrance with four white columns. There are two banners with small images of Peel programming, advertising hanging at the entrance. Four cement steps lead up to the door. A person with dark skin and a blue and black checkered shirt walks past in front of the building. So um, the things that I'm going to be talking about are related, of course, to what Alice considered or brought up and dive a little bit deeper into the nuts and bolts of what to think about when doing a virtual event and also sharing with you what we've been doing at the Peel. So the six areas which are similar, again, to what Alice mentioned um, would be communication and outreach, the platform or platforms you're using, site access, sound access, and then intellectual, cognitive, and or developmental access. So for communication and outreach, a lot of the access uh, things to think about are similar to what you would do if you're doing a program um, in person. Are you reaching out to disability communities, lift serves and organizations? Do you know people in disability communities um, that you can directly be in touch with? Word of mouth is, as I'm sure many of you know, a great and one of the best ways to get people to come to community. So building relationships uh, with, with disability communities is really important and making sure they know you are offering accessible programming or wanting to learn how to do better. Um, providing in-depth information ahead of time. That's something that we're working on, um, offering PowerPoints ahead of time so people can know what they're kind of getting into. Um, offering information about accessibility ahead of time, having contact information for a person that's on staff. If someone doesn't see an access that they need um, available for a program so they can check in with people. Um, offering instructions ahead of time on how to use platforms. 
uh, so many people are moving on to Zoom and other online platforms right now, and there's slowly an assumption that, well, someone's already been on a Zoom call, so we don't need to teach people how to use it. So really remembering that it's so crucial to always have instructions for how to use platforms um, and making it easy for people to give feedback. We have an email, access at thepeelcenter.org. We always love feedback um, for from folks. So for what the Peel Center has been doing, we have been working on updating our website um, and putting information about accessibility all over our website. So it's hard to miss. Um, it's on the main page. We have information on our current and upcoming programs page. Every event that we're listing is going to have this information. We also have it under a visit tab and a what's on tab. So um, it's it's really everywhere and that and that's often what we what we suggest because if someone's looking for this information, they want to be able to find it right away so that they feel really welcome. Uh, the platforms, um, there's no platform that's perfect yet. <laughs> Accessibility is on, unfortunately not just a here's the answer. Um, so having different access points is really important. If people have specific questions about um, platforms, you can write them in the chat box. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right now with that, but always making sure that you, there is a non-internet based option, a phone line. I'm sure many of you are thinking and hearing a lot right now about what's happening with schools where um, schools have moved to online learning and so many people don't have access to the internet. So we really want to make sure that there is a phone line option. Um, what the Peel Center is doing is a little bit complicated. We've been looking into a lot of different um, ways to do our programming. And like I said at the beginning, we are in the learning phases as well. So currently what we are doing is the people who are presenting are in Microsoft Teams. We have a paid account with Microsoft Teams. Um, we are streaming that onto Facebook and YouTube. And YouTube has our captions added there because you can't add your own captions into Microsoft Teams. Um, and then that is embedded on our website using a web service ManyCam. So as I was saying, different access points are great. We have a bunch of them. Um, we're learning what works best and we always have a phone number. For site access, the, um, Cheryl's gonna talk a little bit more about this and give us a great a little tutorial about using a screen reader. And many of these things Alice mentioned, I will also say keeping in mind that what you're putting in a chat window. Um, oftentimes in online programming, people are you know, adding more thoughts back and forth and resources in the chat box. It's a great, it's a great resource, but making sure that information is being communicated in multiple ways for people. Um, we, um, for our website, it's screen reader friendly mostly. It's not perfect. We're also working on that too. You'll see an example of that later. Um, we are trying to provide visual descriptions for all our programs, both with our um, the folks who are giving the presentations as I gave a visual description of that image earlier um, for people who are doing programs with us who are not comfortable doing visual descriptions themselves, we're gonna be working with having um, a person give those in, in the programming live, similarly to how an ASL interpreter would um, give ASL interpretation live. And like I said, we're making the resources available afterwards. Captioning, Alice mentioned that. Um, there are two types of captions, auto captions, which are computer generated. A few different web services have those. Um, there's pros and cons with that. They're never fully accurate, which can not provide full access to people, but they are often free. Um, and then CART, communication access, real-time translation, and more formally known as CART, <laughs> um, gives the, has a live person, which we are using right now, just, typing exactly what's being said. So that is the most accessible option to use. And then of course there's American Sign Language Interpretation. Um, those things are not interchangeable. Different people um, use one or the other or both. It's again a thing that's important to learn from your community, what they prefer. Um, closed captioning is a universally accessible thing for people, as Alice was mentioning, all the benefits to it. Um, and American Sign Language is the, often the language that deaf folks use primarily. So closed captioning is not um, completely, the, you know, by itself is not complete access. And it's important to speak slowly. That's one thing I am working on a lot. Alice is very good at that. Um, 
both for the cart provider, for people to who are taking in the information, um, if there's an interpreter, all of these things. And to in identify yourself when speaking, also something I am working on too. Um, the Peel Center is providing CART for all of our programs. This is the first time we're doing that, and moving forward, we're going to be doing that. So that's a commitment we've made. And we will also provide ASL interpretation if it's requested ahead of time. And then intellectual, cognitive, and developmental access. This covers a lot of different disabilities, things that Alice mentioned as well, people with dementia, ADHD, autism, um, traumatic brain injury. I mean, it, it really is many, many different things. So a few, a few access points that are important to keep in mind are thinking about multisensory information, um, keeping language simple, making sure to avoid flashing lights and strobes, Explaining the format of the program at the beginning, you'll notice, looking back, Nancy uh, told us about what was going to be happening, when you could ask questions, how long it was going to be happening, um, and then reinforce what is being said with written text. When I first learned how to do PowerPoints, I remember everyone saying, too much text, don't put too much text, and, um, and for an access point, that's why there's a lot of text on here. It's really helpful for people, like Alice mentioned, to be able to read the text and then to go back again as a resource. Um, and as far as the, the Peel Center, I think this is one of our biggest growth areas that we're really learning about how to make our programs more accessible on these levels. So these are some resources. Um, there's so many resources out there. These are four that I uh, pulled, I think, that are really great ones to start with. Um, after this webinar, if you're like, yes, I want to learn more about this, I want to really try and learn how to do this, I would say go to the Rooted Rights, How to Make Your Virtual Meetings and Events Accessible to the Disability Community. They have a really great how-to guide with lots of links. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts created a resource for online um, virtual accessibility. That's actually how we found our live captioners now and how I found the Rooted Rights uh, link. So they also have lots of great resources. And then for storytellers specifically, the Cooper Hewitt guidelines for image description are a great thing to go to to learn more about how to give image descriptions. Um, and storytellers are great at doing that because you're painting pictures with your words all the time. So I'm sure you would all get a kick out of that. And then the last one I wanted to mention was the National Center on Disability and Journalism and their language style guide, which is in Spanish and English. That is an incredible resource. Um, we didn't talk much about language today, but that, I mean, disability and language are a very complicated and rich and important thing to be thinking about. Um, and if you're a storyteller and talking about people with disabilities or building relationships with the disability community, it's really crucial to do some of your own work on learning a little bit more about um, the language. That in the guide, they have a little bit of the history of different words, which is really, really great. So these are the four resources I encourage people to check out. Um, and then here's a slide that has the contact information for Cheryl, myself, and Alice. Um, again, I'll leave this slide up for a second if people want to write that down, but that is also going to be available after the presentation. Um, yeah, if you have questions, please um, write them in the chat box or write them down and share them later. We're going to have Cheryl give her part of the presentation now, and then we'll open up for questions afterwards. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Did I stop sharing it? Great. OK. Um, you are uh, still visible in video. Robin. OK, That's I will turn that off. Thank you. So Cheryl and David, take us away. Thank you. Can you see me and hear me all right? Uh, Cheryl, I think you need to angle your camera down a little bit. We're currently getting a nice view of your ceiling fan. <laughs> How's that? Right. That's perfect. Thank you. All right. So as Robin said, I use a screen reader, which is voice output. So anything that comes into a computer, if a screen reader is working on the computer, will be voice output from the monitor through some geek language into the sound card. So you will hear it as synthetic speech in a minute. And I am ready for you to start running the video. So once 
slight pause here. Um, Do you need me to talk for a minute? I am. I can run it. I wasn't sure if I was. Okay. One sec. Oh, this is sorry. It is um. It is currently playing. David or Nancy, um, this is Robin. Um, I'm not seeing the video playing. Is that just my screen or? It's just your screen. It's playing on okay. YouTube. Sorry. All right, Cheryl, you are back. Thank you. So I hope you got a taste for what a screen reader does on the Peel Center website. Um, most there are third party software screen readers. They're also built in on the different phones and computers. If you want more demos, you can search for YouTube and screen reader demos. And there are people who do this as a living and do them. Uh, much more polished in a way that I did. Um, I, ha I usually do these presentations in person, so moving it online was a challenge for me. So that's why the quality. Um, so the thing about screen readers is whatever platform needs to be compatible with them and design. For example, uh, WordPress is good. There's a bunch of other good platforms, but there are um, these things change a lot, and so if you look at a platform's help and see what they say about accessibility, the more detailed information they give, the more likelihood someone will have actually studied that and figured it out. And you can, if you want, while you're creating content, um, pull up a default screener in your operating system on Windows. It's Narrator. 
on the Mac, it's voiceover. On the iPhone, it's voiceover. And on Android phones, it's talkback. Um, you won't be familiar with uh, understanding it, but it'll kind of give you an impression of, of what content is spoken. And the other thing I'd say is make sure that your content is navigable from the keyboard, that I can tab around, you can use headings, you can get to the information you need to get to uh, without using a mouse. Because if you use a mouse to hear it, the control may or may not be keyboard driven. So just kind of play around and test it. And something more formal, there are uh, organizations that do user testing with community members and there are ways to get a hold of that. Um, but if you use my contact information and contact me, I can put you in touch with resources or you can Google around. Um, this is just to raise awareness. And thank you and I'll let you go to Q&A or wherever. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, this is Robin. Yeah, so that is a lot of information. Um, let me turn my video back on. A uh, lot of information, but we really wanted to give you all a little taste of what we've been working on and specifically what uh, accessibility looks like online. So if folks have specific questions about anything we shared, if there's something that you've tried, um, really this is about us being a learning community together. A lot of us are figuring this out for the first time. Many people have been doing this work for a long time. So um, not sure Nancy or Heather, if any questions have come through. Just having a quick look here over, this is Nancy, um, over at our uh, chat on the Peel Center website on the live page. Um, so I'll be feeding some questions in from that if I may. I, I noted a few that I had uh, as you all were talking. Um, first, one, one quick um, minor correction. The Peel actually, like all nonprofits, is um, able to have a free Microsoft Teams account by virtue of being a nonprofit. So thanks to the generosity of Microsoft, we are not having to pay for that platform at least, um, although we certainly pay for all the rest of them. <laughs> um, one question that I had was about something that we've been talking about and uh, in terms of the Peel's own accessibility um, and particularly for people who are sign language users. Um, we looked at, I think, Alice, you brought up the, the question of whether VRS or video relay service might work, um, given that we do always have a phone number associated with our online presentations, so people can dial that phone number and get access to the audio only feed. Um, and I, I think there was the, uh, the hope that that might be useful to VRS users in terms of getting some sort of signed translation of that audio feed um, to their video phones. So this is really kind of a question for the three of you, but also for anyone who might be listening in and have experience with VRS. Um, what do you see as, as the potential, but also I guess the challenges for using a, a technology like that? This is Alice. One of the problems that deaf people have with these video platforms, they can see the faces of the speakers and they can see their mouths moving, but they can't lip read because the the uh, clarity is not there. So that that is a problem for people who are lip readers. Um, those who want sign language find it a lot easier if someone who is a terp, an interpreter, could change the audio into sign. And that's the whole purpose of the video relay service. This is Robin. Um, yeah, I think one other thing just colloquially that I have also heard um, that relay services were um, really, really popular before um, before smartphones really came to be. And actually, that's how smartphones were developed, was through, um, because of deaf community members and, and kind of this history of, of, the, of the video phone. So now that's a, it's 
relay is something that um, you have to have a specific channel for, a specific technology for. And I think with people having their own smartphones now, you know, calling someone and FaceTiming them and, and signing from, from deaf person to deaf person is, is much more um, common. And so that's something that, you know, I as far as this assistive technology is really learning about who's using what and where is really the research that we need to do from the peel of, of local Baltimore community um, and the deaf community here and, and what people are using if that is a service. Thank you, definitely something that I know we'll be looking into further. Um, one other question is about this um, conflict in design, something that you brought up, Robin, um, in terms of PowerPoints. Like you, I recall um, being told at a certain point to put as little text as possible in my PowerPoints. <laughs> um, and uh, it was really interesting to hear you say that there's actually a, a bit of a conflict there, um, and or at least eliminating all text and just using big images um, is perhaps not the best accessibility practice. Um, do you have any thoughts about how to kind of balance those, I guess, design or, or aesthetics best practices with the accessibility ones? This is Cheryl. Uh, there are some people use the notes pane a lot for the text and the extra information and more detail and then everyone gets all the detail and you can choose to just look at notes view if that's all you want is the text. Oh, that's a great plan. Yeah. Okay. So in that way people can choose whether they're looking at the the PowerPoint slide field which is the image or or getting the text only version as it were. Right, because the slides will say something has notes. You tab the next one and it may not say that and the next one will. So it indicates. And then you switch views. I think this is Robin. Um, one thing we're also going to try and do next time um, is obviously with CART, you know, there's one or two lines of text happening on the screen at a time um, and you can't scroll back and see what people have said. But um, we are able to put, because we're hosting this on our website, we're able to put a text box pane underneath the video screen um, where you would be able to read more of the text that's being said. So um, I, I think that that might be another thing that once we have done that, taking using less text in a PowerPoint because the cart transcriber is writing it all out. So that's written there. Um, but but again, it's, you know, what what is it used for? So if the PowerPoint is for a presentation, it can have, you know, what what it, what does it need to be versus, and I, I was thinking when I was creating it of people on the webinar wanting to have this and myself actually included later on to say, oh, what was that thing that we were, what was the detail about that? And what were the really specific points versus just a heading that said, you know, five words. So uh, I don't think that there's an answer. Wow. Or there are multiple answers. It's, it seems it's, to be yeah. <laughs> exactly. accessibility. Um, we have a question from George Sissel, um, who is, uh, I would just like to give a shout out to George as being a real inspiration and leader in accessibility in the arts. And um, he asks about, um, in addition to the important initiatives the Peel has launched, what kinds of support or resources are available uh, there from the Maryland State Arts Council? Uh, yeah, this is Robin. So the Maryland State Arts Council has just um, started an official um, task force. I don't know, exactly know the terminology that they're using, but but work on around accessibility in the arts um, in the last, really in January, I think, was when they had their first public event, um, which a lot of us have been a part of here. And so they're really working right now internally to um, look at their policies and procedures as well as best practices and kind of being a, um, 
an example for other arts organizations in the state. And I am hoping that will also eventually turn into funding arts organizations and artists uh, to do more accessibility work because um, I always like to talk about that actually accessibility doesn't always need money. Um, I mean, it, it often needs money, but as Alice said in the title of her presentation, it's about communication and there's so much you can do without money um, that we all can learn about, but there's also a lot that takes money. So um, hoping that they will, will be able to start um, having funding for people who are really trying, both who are disabled artists, but then others who are trying to make their work more accessible. Um, the, their summit is next week. Um, if folks haven't heard about that, and I think they have two or three presentations that touch on accessibility. Um, I'll be presenting similar content to what we did here today. Um, so yeah, they're, they're working on it. We have another question from Ariel. Um, given there's so many Zoom meetings happening, do you all have suggestions on how best to use Zoom where there isn't closed captioning options like YouTube? I think yeah, go ahead, Alice. Sorry. I can speak to that <clears throat> because we encourage our presenters in the virtual world, which is just a little step beyond Zoom, to, to do their presentations in voice and text simultaneously. So if they are able to speak, they can use the voice to text transcriber that's built into their computer to type into the chat screen. And that works reasonably well. It's about as good as the Google translation on on the YouTube channel. Some of them sometimes they get some funny sentences, and we've all seen those. But that's one option. And another option would be to hire someone to type what you're saying. It could be a, a full cart transcription or a gist transcription. This is Robin. Yeah, I, I'm noticing in the chat. Um that uh, Linda mentioned, I recently compared CART real-time real-person transcription with Zoom computer-generated transcription. I was surprised that the computer-generated transcription was actually more accurate. So one thing to clarify, and Alice or Cheryl, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Zoom does not have a built-in automatic generated transcription um, or captioning. The Microsoft Teams does, uh, PowerPoint does, but Zoom, what Zoom has is the option to plug in um, a cart, you know, a live transcriber, or, you know, there are ways to plug in an automated, automated um, captioning like Otter AI. There's, there's different services where you can plug one in, but what maybe you saw, Linda, was um, actually a cart transcriber through Zoom. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, Zoom doesn't have their own auto transcription. So it's, it's, a, it's a thing where you either have to pay for one or like Alice mentioned, um, you know, kind of hacking the system. But that's one of the reasons that Zoom is, um, you know, there's the pros and cons of Zoom. This is Nancy. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Cheryl actually to talk about that a little bit. I think I've understood that as a webinar platform, Zoom is uh, more accessible to screen reader users than, for example, Microsoft Team and possibly some of the others. Is that correct? Yes, Zoom is pretty simple. And so you just kind of tab through or swipe through the controls. They've labeled everything properly um, under more under transcript. If someone is putting captions in, you can see it. Uh, you can put things in the, the text box. Um, it's a simpler interface. The Teams, because it has multiple screens and multiple functions, sometimes a screen reader will lose focus and you'll, I'll be in the wrong window. Um, and so although they have accessibility shortcuts and they've been working on it, it they don't always work as advertised. Yeah, and uh, this is Nancy again. Just to clarify, this is part of why we are actually presenting this webinar and most of our other ones not directly in Teams. That's where our presenters are working. Um, but we're inviting the public to see, to watch the presentation through the Peels website, um, really via YouTube, because we know that simple web pages, HTML web pages, and YouTube screens are incredibly accessible and used by lots of people. So it seemed to be 
the simplest route for us where we could just provide a link. There didn't need to be any software downloads or passwords. So we use Teams, as it were, to originate the content. I think you went over this a bit earlier, Robin, um, but we don't, at least we've been moving away from having inviting the public actually into Teams. Um, we have also used Zoom. Um, and I really like the way that it has a, you can assign a participant to be a captioner. Um, so if you have a, a cart transcriber, that person can provide um, live cart transcription for the session. The only thing that um, continues to be problematic, and we actually experienced this on Saturday, is uh, just how vulnerable Zoom is to hackers. And um, we spent a lot of time locking down Zoom before our Saturday presentation, and we're feeling pretty good about it. It was a sold out show, and we had a few spaces open up. So we publicized the link and the password to get in. And in less than 30 seconds, we were Zoom bombed. So there is unfortunately a group of people out there who are really um, preying on Zoom sessions and looking out for those links to disrupt them. So as long as that is fun and games for some people, I do feel that um, Zoom sessions are particularly vulnerable, um, especially if you're trying to make a link and a password widely available um, to a large number of people. It's just too easy to uh, for those those links and things to get shared with folks who want to abuse them, unfortunately. So it'd be very interesting for us to hear back um, everybody's experience on this and whether we've succeeded in striking the right balance between security and accessibility and ease of use um, for this session. Um, there was, uh, let's see, I think um, there was a question about the summit that Robin mentioned, but perhaps we have an answer thanks to uh, to Heather. Is that uh, the three play media? So this is, this is Robin. Um, there's actually two great uh, furry arts and access related summits happening next week. So um, Heather just linked a different one that I actually did want to mention. So this is great. Um, Three Play Media is an organization that does great work. They're more they're centered in disability work, so they're experts in the field. Um, and they have a uh, four, three or four day free um, kind of online many different workshops that really talk more about. Um, the tech side and really, really the how to's of accessibility. Um, and that's what was linked there. Uh, I tried to put in the Maryland Art Summit, but I can't put directly into the chat because I'm not registered, which is a thing for me to pay attention to next time. Um, so if um, you want to shoot that to me, perfect. I can Yes, so so the one that I was mentioning earlier is the Maryland Art Summit, which is hosted by the Maryland State Arts Council and I believe um, a few other organizations. Yeah, Maryland Culture for the Arts, Cultures for the Arts, and a few other groups. All right. Um, we also actually had a question from Heather about accessible PDFs, if you don't mind uh, taking that one. I know that's been a challenge. <laughs> Um, <laughs> what's the question relating to I mean the basic answer is it needs to be text and image and you get people to get text into PDF by saying that if you provide optical character recognition of the text the PDF is searchable because sighted people who don't care whether or not it's accessible still may want to search the PDF um, so that's the that's the use case for it um, and there are things you can do in PDF and design um, to make sure that the text is recognized, the form fields are labeled. Similarly, when I was using the demo and going through the web, the fields, you know, the, the form fields need to be labeled. And in your PDF forms, make your forms fillable. Um, the form fields need to be labeled in Microsoft, make your Microsoft forms fillable. There's a whole bunch of resources out there for document creation and uh, it, it just takes a little extra design steps at the, the front end, but at the end, it's uh, more usable if you can do that. So and did this, that answer the question? I don't know what the question was exactly. This is Alice. What I'd just like to add is that taking your Word document and saving as 
PDF does not make it accessible. True. This is Robin. I, I did also want to um, call attention to a comment from Yoshi, who's a friend of mine, um, an incredible uh, deaf artist here in Baltimore. And he says on the text chat, for me, CART was better than other ways because of the communication way at MICA. So, um, you know, direct feedback from a user of the service that CART really worked best for him. Great. Well, we are um, coming up to the hour here, so no need to shut this down prematurely, but I did just want to do a call out if anybody has any other questions or comments that they'd like for us to voice to our participants here. Uh, now's the time. And perhaps to our participants, um, any other questions or comments to one another and to our group? This is Robin. Um, I also just want to remind folks to contact us directly at access at the peelcenter.org with any feedback about this webinar. I saw um, in the beginning there were some issues with the webinar starting on the page, so we will definitely look at that. Thank you all for um, commenting on that. But anything else, um, you know, or if you're interested in, in working with us on accessibility, we really um, are committed to being part of the Baltimore Baltimore wide network of, of making art and cultural events more accessible. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And again, the um, these resources will be available um, Heather, do you want to say exactly where they're going to be posted? I believe we decided to put them on the event link that's on our website. I think that's right. This is Nancy. Sorry, I'm not sure if um, Heather's in a position to voice right now. I'll just uh, pop into the chat window on the website the link to the actual event page for this webinar. Um, it's the peelcenter.org slash events slash inclusive hyphen design hyphen webinar. Um, and everyone who has registered to attend, that means we have your email address. So we will send you uh, a link to the page and an alert when we have everything online and in one hopefully convenient place for you. All right, great. Well, Thank you so much. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Cheryl. As always, it's a pleasure working with you all. And um, I'm reminded once again that accessibility takes a village. <laughs> so um, I also want to thank David London, um, who's been running our online broadcast in the background, Heather Shelton, who manages our online presence and all of our, our publicity and our online media. Um, and uh, thank you all, most importantly, you, the community of the Peel, who by showing up today are showing your interest and your support for accessibility in the cultural sector. And um, that's a really important and enormous encouragement to us to keep working on always getting better. So thanks again, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Um, we will be doing a virtual tour of the Peel tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. So if anybody has not had the opportunity to visit the Peel or if you're missing it, as I am terribly, it'll be a chance to uh, take a virtual walkthrough with David London and me. It's going to be a very quick one um, through uh, Baltimore Heritage. And I will um, post the link to that event uh, in the chat here in just a moment. So with that, um, I think I'll say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Hey, good job. <laughs>